everyone. This is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to our fireside chat with a special guest. We have in the house Sumitra Dutta, the dean of Oxford's Said Business School. Sumitra brings a tremendous wealth of <laughs> academic experience. He had been before taking on his job, job at Oxford in June of last year, 2022. Uh, the dean at the S.C. Johnson uh, College of Business at Cornell. Those who know Sumitra know that he did the very controversial <laughs> and important thing in bringing together three schools at Cornell, the School of Hotel Administration, along with the undergraduate and graduate business schools while he was there. And of course, he had long before that a very long, distinguished career at NCIAD. Sumitra, welcome. Thank you so much, John. How are you enjoying Oxford? Well, Oxford is Oxford, so you know, it's a real privilege to be here. And it's a great uh, intellectual life and a great cultural life, so great, wonderful. And I know you've described Oxford as being more than just a university. It's the UK's gift to the world, is how you put it. Explain that. Tell us why. Yeah, yeah it's interesting, you know, so... Um, Oxford is very, very global. So that's one you know, element which is very obvious. So almost 95% of our students come from outside the UK. So that's a factual sort of element of being of the world. But what I think is much more important and interesting is the way people think at Oxford about their work, about the impact of the work. And I think the thinking in Oxford inherently over centuries, I would say, it's not just a question of the last five years, has been about how can we shape the world in different ways. Today, of course, the dialogue is about shaping the world for the future, you know, for the better. And so I think inherently, whenever you have a discussion of any kind at Oxford, uh, the immediate sort of question that people ask is, you know, how can it improve Africa? How can it improve Asia? How can it actually improve, you know, the less privileged parts of society? And that's a natural part of the discussion, you know, in any research or any program discussion, which I find very interesting and very amazing. That is, especially in the environment of a business school. And of course, uh, University of Oxford, uh, as these things go, is relatively new in terms of having a business school. I wonder what's the school's position within the university and how do you gain the great advantages of one of the world's best universities um in that environment so the business school itself is relatively new 25 years old more or less and in 25 years it has built a you know quite a solid reputation for itself and i always tell and remind people that that would not have been possible without oxford university as the mothership as a base for what we are doing so oxford has been very very important in terms of the building of the school and it is true that there was some controversy at Oxford when the school was set up. You know, there were faculty members who, some of them, you know, were questioning whether the university needed needed a business school. But I would say that today, as I joined the university, I haven't felt any element of the doubt any longer. Today, much more, the university really welcomes the business school, wants the business school to be an important part of the programs of the research inside the university. And today, we are really, uh, you know integrated in the university more and more in multiple ways. Uh, for example, entrepreneurship, which is a very key element of what students are asking for and what the university is trying to focus on. Uh, you know, we are sort of architecting the entire entrepreneurship program across the entire university. And we are having faculty members who are designing, participating in the programming of all these entrepreneurship programs. And we're building collaborations with the medical division, with other kind of departments across the university. And so really are very much a part of the university today uh, in, in, in very fundamental ways. And the university re also realizes that for maintaining its excellence and for being a university that is very much designed for the future, it needs a strong and a vibrant. When students come to your school, do they get the chance to intersect with the greater university very much? You know, that's the beauty of Oxford, and that's also the complication sometimes, is that every student is a member of a college, and every faculty member is a member of a college. So the two are intertwined. The university and the college is about 39 colleges in the entire system. 
in a very deep fundamental manner. So let's say a student you know, is part of the MBA program, the executive MBA program, is part of the community at Saeed and you know, enjoys all the things that business schools bring. But then the student is also a member of the college and in the college, the colleges bring together students from a variety of disciplines, variety of degrees, and the students get to mix with students from philosophy and political science and biology and mathematics in a very natural and easy manner. And so the life of a student out here is inherently richer because you have the both the business school life and the college life. And combining the two, I think, makes for a great experience. And that's what students value and actually benefit a lot from their Oxford experience. And that, I have to say that that, <clears throat> if not unique, that's certainly an unusual uh, attribute of the experience because where else can you actually find people of that kind of caliber in all these other disciplines and colleges uh, and get the chance to sit with them in a dining hall and to have a conversation about a societal issue that's uh, of import? I mean, it's it's that's a rare and special experience. And and if I just add to that, John, you know, the the protocols have been designed to sort of en encourage that interaction. So in a typical Oxford, uh, you know, table long table based dinner or lunch, mm -hmm. the rule is that you go and take the next available position in that long table. You cannot just sit where you want. So. Uh, you know, the person you sit next to is a little bit of chance and a serendipity. Who is next to you? And then what kind of conversations you'll have? And I can tell you that, you know, the quality of people you meet out there is so incredibly, you know, high and of intellectually rich that I've had great conversations. Some of them are just interesting and nothing more. Some of them lead to interesting collaborations and new ideas to explore. So I think that beauty of serendipity is something that you see happening at Oxford naturally it's part of the design of the entire university yes now what what are the key features of the mba program it's a one-year program of course and um mm -hmm. i think it's it's also unique in terms of how it's structured and what you have students go through yeah so no i cannot take much credit for the way the mba program is structured so innovatively and is positioned so well but my predecessors including Peter Tufano, who was my immediate preceding dean, I think what they really did was they positioned the business school and its focus around impact, a positive impact in the world. And again, this was not difficult to do because that's what the philosophy and the basic ethos of Oxford University is and how do you actually help improve the world. So when the business school came in, basically the focus was how can we use that, the power of business to improve the world and have a positive impact. Today, it seems the, you know, the motto of every business school and every business school is claiming to do it, you know, in different ways, but it was in the heart of the site school 25 years ago, and it remains. So I think in some sense, a lot of the students who come here, a lot of the companies who come here are trying to understand better how can we create collectively a positive impact in the world. I'll give you an example. So we have a very well-established center called the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship. So we have, in fact, we run the Global School Forum of Social Entrepreneurship, and we have so many great social entrepreneurs who come actually and do research and discuss about ways in which they can have a positive impact on the world. Now, we know that companies today also need to do that. You know, so major corporations need to understand how to align their programs and their activities and their business goals along with social goals and along with how to do social good. And they, in fact, are you know keen to be part of Oxford's program because they can learn from our experience in this area. They can interact with students in this area. They can work with other peers who are doing more in that area. So I really feel that the focus of the school is to produce great business leaders, but who have that social and the positive impact on the world mindset. I think that's really what in many ways the world needs today also. And in fact, isn't there a major um, project where MBAs are engaged in significant societal challenges uh, when they're in the program? Absolutely. So the program has many required components, 
which get them to rethink the future of capitalism, which actually get them to work on multidisciplinary teams to address global challenges, which are complex challenges combining business, society, and government issues. Uh, we also have a very successful one plus one program where because the program is one year in the business school, students can do a second year of a master's degree in another you know, discipline of the choice. Could be the public school, public policy school, could be some other school, school of you know physical sciences or life sciences and other disciplines. So you can combine things much more easily inside the system. But structurally, yes, you know, we have many required elements that get people to mix across disciplines and also get students to think about what they're doing and how it can be improved in terms of the overall context of the world in which you find ourselves today. Plus, you, you've been successful at um, getting close to gender balance, right? I'm very pleased about that. You know, diversity is part of the core, let's say, you know, motto and important objective of the program. And this year we've already reached almost parity, 48% female. And, you know, it just changes the nature of the discussion in the classroom and nature of the dynamics of the groups, you know, in the, inside the MBA program. And I hope we can not just retain it, but also improve it in the future. I think it's also important to note that you're not an MBA factory. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're not graduating uh, close to a thousand or massive numbers of people. So this is a very intimate program where everyone gets to know each other. And there's very high, it's a high touch program with, with um, faculty very much involved in the development of young people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think again, it's linked to this, ethos of how education learning is done at Oxford, which is a small group tutoring method. Of course, we cannot follow the same small group tutoring completely in the business school, but still the high touch relationship orientation is sort of inherent in the way we operate. And then in the colleges, the students get that high touch environment also in a different perspective. So the lives, whether in the business school or in the colleges are very sort of high intensity, high touch, relationship-based experiences. When I think of Oxford, of course, I think of uh, tradition. I think of rituals, um, but but you've been able to create uh, in the business school, a very modern and contemporary program within this context of maintaining tradition and, and, and the rituals that make Oxford what it is. Uh, which which has to be kind of an interesting cultural uh, dynamic. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think, you know, you cannot escape the culture and the history at Oxford. You know, even the college that I belong to, Balliol College, and established in 1263, you know, so it's amazing, amazing in terms of history. So, you know, you always have this situation where you are living in and, and sort of straddling two worlds. The one world is the world of tradition and history, that you know goes back many centuries and brings with it its own benefits at the same time sometimes constraints on the other hand you have the modern day world which uh, really reflects today's challenges today's demands and sort of brings you in contact with other great scientists and you know researchers across the university now struggling those two worlds is a great learning experience the great you know living experience uh, you know, when I sometimes walk in the evenings from dinner to home or from home to dinner or whatever, um, you know, wearing the Oxford gowns and, you know, going for or coming from a high table dinner and, and seeing the history and the beauty of the history out there, you know, I have to pinch myself to say, no, is this real? And uh, it's a, really a privilege, I believe, for anyone, uh, whether it's a faculty member or a student, to experience that for some time in your life. Now, of course, no one experiences Oxford for a whole life necessarily physically, but it stays as part of your culture, your DNA. And I think that changes you, transforms you in the way you think. I think that's very important. So I'm sure you see people um, strolling about campus in tuxedos at times, right? Oh, very often, very <laughs> often. I think I have worn my tuxedo more times in the last six months than in the last <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing, really. That, that, seriously, that that just says so much about the place, the tradition, the history. Um, and, you know, we, we live in such a turbulent world 
there's just something gentle and sophisticated about that that I find comforting, to be honest. Now, one of, one of the things, obviously, um, you do that maybe many other colleges at Oxford may not do um, is a real focus on personal development. And I've always said that one of the great things about an MBA program is you not only learn the basics and the fundamentals in business, be it accounting, finance, marketing, strategy, uh, but you also become professionally developed, that, that there's a lot of attention paid to you as an individual and how you're going to become effective in, in the modern world. And I wonder if you could talk to, uh, to me a little bit about what your approach is to personal development and leadership in the program. I think this is a great question, John. And you know, Oxford is a place that really has produced leaders for the world for centuries. Um, if I just take the UK alone, you know, it's it's quite remarkable. Since 1945, all British prime ministers, except four, have come from Oxford. And of the four, three did not not have college degrees. So the only one of the college degree that did not come from Oxford is only one. Okay. Now, the fact of the matter is that this is true also for other global leaders. And I can, in my own country, home country, India, some of the leaders have come from Oxford. In the US, many of the leaders in the US also were Rhodes Scholars, you know, they came from Oxford, had Oxford, Oxford experience. So if you look at the basic sort of ethos inside the university is that we are producing leaders who will in fact shape the future of the world, shape the future society and do it in good ways. So that's the context in which everything is sort of thought through. And in that context, you place business leaders. And of course, you know, in our programs, we do emphasize constantly. And many of the students who come to us believe in that, that here's a place I can actually harness the power of business to do good for the world. Mm -hmm. And that you do from, you know, your programs that you have, the kind of courses you take, the kind of interactions you have with the fellow students who come from a similar mindset. The mindset inside Oxford is not necessarily, let me do just business to make a higher salary. Yes, money is important. We need good jobs, but let's use the jobs for making the world a better place. I think that's very important in terms of ethos. And also what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, these students spend a significant part of their lives in the colleges. And these colleges are great social environments in which they learn from other people with other perspectives, other you know fellow citizen leaders who will also be part of important change projects in the future. So what you learn really is that how you appreciate, how you value different perspectives, and not just in business, but even in other disciplines completely. And you do this much more intensely than what I would say happens in any normal university. Of course, you can argue, you know, some of this could happen in any normal university. But I think here it is part of the core DNA, the way the whole system is structured. So it happens much more naturally and much more frequently. Yes. And we know that historically in the U.S. in particular, uh, the business school was created on the periphery of the university campus and often was, in some ways, a desert island <laughs> in the environment of the university. This has changed somewhat, but it's not what how you're describing the way the business school yeah. is linked to the other colleges at Oxford. You know, one of, one of my favorite things to do when I visit a campus is to go to a pub, in the case of um, the UK, and to have a pint with a group of students. And the question I always ask is, you know, years after you graduate, looking back on your education and how formative it was, uh, what are the three things that are going to resonate with you most? And I wonder what your MBA students might tell me if I went to a pub and the bartender draw a pint. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I've asked similar questions also of some alumni that I meet with. And I think, you know, uh, what students appreciate a lot is the kind of impact Oxford left on them as young, you know, impressionable minds. So they come to Oxford as bright young people, typically in the late 20s, but also some older than that. And then Oxford sort of changes the perspective on life, makes them, you know, 
sort of increase inspires them increases aspirations to do better and go you know good things in the world and i think what most people tell me when i talk to alumni is that oxford inspired them so the level of inspiration they get from not just the peers you know peers of course interesting but also from what they see happening in the university at large is just inspirational for them and by raising the by inspiring them i think what we're doing is raising the aspiration levels for many of them and you know i think many of them what i hope and then the question they ask really is have i made a positive difference in the societies or countries where i'm living and that i think is the key question that they ask and i think most you know us all of us should be asking ourselves you know we have been privileged and I always tell people that you know to have a degree from oxford any of the top university is a privilege compared to the global population of 7 billion people you know most of them don't have access to that and the question is you know what are we doing in the privilege yeah sure we are earning good salaries and leading good lives but how are we actually helping you know improve the world as a whole and if we can be inspired to do that i think that's how oxford changes people's lives and people's you know uh, aspirations you know earlier when we were talking about societal challenges and tackling them uh you mentioned one that i think is very topical and that is the future of capitalism there are a lot of people who are concerned about capitalism and how cruel it can sometimes be and i'm imagining that there's a great deal of self selection that goes on at all the business schools but particularly at oxford so people are self selecting into the program uh in a way that makes them identify with these broader bigger goals and i would i would almost bet that the conversations about the future of capitalism at your business school are dramatically different than the conversations at a wharton or a columbia or even a cornell am i right or am i wrong <laughs> yes you're right so you're right and uh, the difference is obviously linked to the context of the history of the university and the basic you know ethos of life out here but i must also say that more than 80% of our students go into finance consulting and tech mm-hmm. so at that sectoral level you know you might argue and say that well you know students are actually taking similar choices than other universities other top schools but i think the kind of experience the kind of mindset they're bringing to these sectors is different and that's what i think is a real contribution of said is in the world of business leaders we are producing great business trained graduates who go into these you know important sectors of finance and tech and consulting and others and they are in fact seeding these organizations with the kind of thoughts and kind of perspective they bring from oxford and that's where i think you know the real sort of discussion debate has an impact because when they on campus they have all these discussions and the programmatic you know features enable them to think about that but ultimately they have to apply them in a certain business context and i think it's very important to keep in mind that not you know certain number of students do actually go into pure important you know ngo or impact oriented let's say social jobs but the vast majority go into mainstream business but they're going to mainstream business with a certain perspective and a certain outlook. Yes. Uh absolutely. Now, Sumitra, as you know, um there's there's always been truth be told uh a lot of discussion about the future of the MBA and there is the belief in the US that the MBA is now a mature product. Uh although in Europe I think there's potential for far more growth in the degree. what what's your sense of the future of the mba and uh are you more optimistic on that side of the pond than perhaps you might have been on this side of the pond so john as you know you know i'm probably one of the select group of business school leaders who have been in leadership positions both sides of the pond uh you know seen it at nsead now at side and also spent time at wharton sorry not at cornell so i think you know of course you have i think the demand for business education is only increasing i don't see any reduction in demand for this education the issue and the question that we have to ask ourselves is 
what is the format, what is the price point, what is the product market fit. So I think the product market fit is something that we have to worry about very carefully. And we cannot just assume that the MBA is always the right product. And this is one reason why you have seen in the last years when a lot of specialized MBAs, uh, sorry, masters of management and specialized topics arising, you're seeing the creation of a lot of different certificate programs out here. So I think what we will have to do inside MBA schools or business schools is you know, respect the fact that the customer's needs are evolving and we also have to evolve the product, not just only in the content internally, which is important, but also in the format and the way it is structured and so on over time. Uh, and I think these are areas where we will see some disruptive thinking. You know, for example, I always ask the question, why can we not think of the MBA as a lifelong subscription service? Mm -hmm. You know, it's completely feasible. It's not doesn't have to be a one year or a two year program because people keep on learning over over time. So it could be like you know, you are in a lifelong learning subscription. You know, that kind of a model. But of course, to make those kinds of changes, will require a lot of courage, a lot of leadership, and a lot of agility inside business schools to be able to drive those changes and get faculty to accept them. So you know, we have a some great opportunities ahead of us. And I think there's a market for both the two-year program, the one-year program. There'll be other kinds of new modification that will arise given the disruption that we're going to see and we are seeing in the education market. Yeah, true. I mean, one of the disruptive forces, obviously, is technology. And we've seen a fairly strong embrace of uh, online virtual uh, higher education. Is that even potentially in the future of Oxford? Absolutely. So one of the initiatives that we are launching at Oxford side is that we are launching our internal ed tech unit. Hmm. So we are in fact switching from working completely and outsourcing the complete e-learning to our partners to in fact building the capability in-house. And the reason why we're doing it is partly because digital programs are an important part of our future, but also because I think we need to have the digital DNA, the digital capabilities inside the organization. They're not a fringe activity for us right now. And tomorrow, how will the future of hybrid education look like? What will the future of personalized education look like? You know, we all use Amazon and Netflix and so on. You know, doing an Amazon Netflix type model in education will be great perhaps, but that will require a different DNA inside the whole system, a different kind of a digitization of the entire enterprise, the entire business school. And today we don't have the capability inside most schools. So part of my goal in building the unit inside is to try and see, can we build over time the digital DNA and the expertise to be able to experiment with these new innovative models? I do think this kind of innovation has to happen because not just of business schools to survive and thrive, but also because if you want to sort of achieve any of the UN SDG goals education, the current models will not work. You have to be able to scale up education and you know, what we're doing. Scalability is key. And the only issue we can, only way we can scale up education is by technology. That's the only way we can do so. We have to find the right kind of flexibility and agility in the product market and the price fit. Right. I mean, it's also central, I would think, to uh, your point about lifetime learning and an MBA subscription model over one's professional life. Uh, not everyone uh, in highly demanding jobs can always return to the university. They need the university to come to them. Absolutely. I mean, an education will be changed and our delivery models will have to change and our products will have to change. But for that, it's not just a question of saying we can keep our internals the same and just change the outside. No, we'll have to change the internals. And that will require fairly you know, gut-wrenching change, I think, in many cases. True. Uh, one of the other ongoing debates is whether a one-year MBA or a two-year MBA is better. Um, I prefer to say they're different. They're not one is better than the other. Although there are many people, and I'm sure you've met them, who argue that a truly transformational graduate experience is a two-year program as opposed to a one-year program. What, what's your view on this? No, my view on this, as I said earlier, is that I think both of them are great. 
every learning opportunity is great. And you can never stop learning. You know, it doesn't matter what the product is and is defined as one year or a two year. You have to keep on learning. And maybe for learning, sometimes a one year is better for you at your given time frame and job or age history. And sometimes two years is better, but your learning does not stop. And if your learning stops, then essentially you're, you know, dating yourself, you're basically, you know, uh, not progressing. So for me, you know, I always tell people is that choose a program that fits your needs now. Could be one year, could be two year. Both of them are great from great schools, but then never, never stop learning. You have to keep on investing in learning and that have it happen in multiple different ways. True. And uh, obviously your predecessor made a lot of progress at the school. And I wonder how you're going to build on that. What's next for the business school at Oxford? Yeah, so I'm very fortunate that, you know, Peter was a great leader and he did a fantastic job. So I have very strong foundations on which to build. But the good thing is, you know, strong foundations, strong university, but great potential for doing more. As sure. I said earlier, you know, education, the current models will not work if we want to play any responsible role in UNSDG goal achievement. So we have to, for example, think very carefully about not just the content of what is happening in the school and the university, which I think Peter did a great job in thinking, where we keep on thinking and rethinking that, but we have to think about how do we scale up our programs? You know, today we're touching maybe 10,000 people, executives and uh, students. Can we touch 100,000? Can we touch a million? You know, it might seem crazy to think of a million numbers right now because, you know, we never do that. But if we don't do that or don't think of how to do it, then we'll never hit the UNSDG goals. You know, how can we actually do this? You know, if the leaders in university education, whether it's Oxford or Stanford or Harvard, whichever university you pick, if they don't play a key role in scaling up the models and scaling up education in the world, you know, we will not make progress. And I always make the question that, you know, somehow the education model that we have, you know, preserved and we celebrate, you know, are a little interesting because while we talk about inclusivity, the educational model that we have created and that we sustain are built on exclusivity. You know, all universities are, you know, they, they with great pride, they say, well, the applications went up by 10% and then we still had to take, you know, only so many because we couldn't take more. And think of all the people who would love to have, have some kind of magic dust of Oxford or Harvard or Cornell, you know, uh, touch. And for them, that would make a huge difference in their own professional life. So, you know, in some sense, I feel that we are not, you know, doing what we could to the degree that we could. So there's an interesting question out here. You know, I don't have all the solutions, but I think these are important questions we have to think about, especially in light of, you know, the global UNSDG goals and the challenges that we are facing to, in, in reaching them. One of the initiatives that Peter created that I was always quite fond of, frankly, was his early identification of focusing on Africa and its importance in the world and more importantly, frankly, it's growing importance or where it's going to, what role it will play in the world in the next quarter of a century. And he was very adamant about um, making sure that the business school brought to its doors um, the best and brightest from Africa. And I wonder if that's an initiative that you also believe in and will plan to continue. No, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, the school has done a fantastic job under Peter's leadership to get the best and brightest from Africa. And I think, you know, typically we get between 10 to 13 percent of our MBA class from Africa, proper from Africa. You know, these are not African students living and working somewhere else. They're people coming from Africa primarily. And that's very useful because you need to build that you know, suitable leadership group in Africa itself. But I think we have to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. You know, getting 20 students, 30 students in Africa is great, but there are millions in Africa. And it comes back to my question of scalability. Yes. For yes. scaling up what we have and actually improving African education, African potential, human potential, our current products and pricing strategies will not fit, you know. So we have to innovate and think of different products and different prices. Mm -hmm. And how do we deliver 80% of the benefits at 20% of the price. 
And that's going to require major rethinking in the system. You know, It's not easy, easy for me to say, but to actually implement it, to make it actually functional and execute on the, you know, the marketing delivery and everything else, it's going to be very, very complicated and difficult. Yeah. So what I'm just trying to say is that Africa is very important. Now, for example, we are in discussions to launch a education without term as micro education for female micro entrepreneurs. You know, mm. so there are lots of female micro entrepreneurs who do micro microfinance loans, and for them, giving you know a thousand dollar loan is wonderful, but they would benefit from a you know fifty dollar education along with that, right. because money plus education actually makes it more powerful. So the question is, you know, how do you provide that fifty dollar education? How do you actually access that market of you know more than? 50 million entrepreneurs who are actually in that category in Africa. Those are very hard questions to actually execute on them. I always say, you know, there's plenty of ideas. The challenge is execution. And if you cannot execute, you know, the ideas are useful ideas, nothing more. It sounds like you're rereading C.K. Prahalad in the bottom of the period, a pyramid. <laughs> I think we have to do something in that, uh, you know, for more people, if you really want to have a positive impact on the world. Because for the impact on the world now, scalability of solution is a key issue. Whether it's climate, whether it's education, whether it's you know food, and, and it doesn't matter which sector you look at. And the UN SDG goals, the key issue right now is scalability. Yes. So, what's your best advice for someone who is interested in exploring the option of coming into your school as an MBA student? You know what I would say is that uh, first of all you are getting an Oxford experience. And Oxford changes your life, prepares you to be a leader in the broader sense. And I saw this myself, you know, I, I, my daughter went to Oxford you know, many, many years ago. And I saw this as a parent, how she changed. You know, mm. she's a computer scientist, so not necessarily a you know, business person, but you know, how she changed over the few years that she was here. And I think it's very important that people who have an ambition to do something good for the world, who want to be inspired by an amazing, you know, university context. And of course, at the same time, get a great, you know, business degree and a great you know, business education. I think for them, you know, Oxford is one of the few places in the world. I'm not saying it's the only one, but I certainly think it's one of the best ones. And I would think that if you would like to be part of that experience, you should visit for sure. Um, Absolutely. And if you visit, yeah. should you pack your tuxedo and make sure that you go into a dining hall? <laughs> well, if you get in, if you get invited for the high table dinners, yes. But otherwise, and also there's plenty of otherwise nice, uh, you know, experiences out here. But it's really, really a special experience that I think, you know, if I think of a leader today, you need what makes you a leader are experiences. Because every experience changes you, touches you, and makes you think in a different way. And so the fact that I went to the U.S. was a great experience for me. It helped me in my life tremendously. Right. The fact that I spent time in, you know, early in Europe was great also. And I think being at Oxford is, in my view, a transformational part of a person's life. And so it is something I recommend very strongly for most young people, if not all. Well, uh, let me just say I'm envious. I wish I was in your position, uh, or even as a student, um, because what well, you John, you're always welcome. <laughs> you're always welcome to come and I'll host you at a high table, so you know you can Indeed. get re-inspired. I mean, you've done amazing things yourself. So, Dimitra, it's been a joy to see you again and to have a conversation like this. Uh, thank you for participating in this. You're welcome. Thank you so much, and. I must say thank you for all the great work you do and I know for students and for the community of business educators. Uh, thank you. I'm passionate about it because I am a true advocate for business education. I really believe it's a no-brainer investment. And you have uh, one of the world's greatest institutions at your back and inside. And um, boy, what a great place to be. All right. Thank you so much. Thank this you so is much. John Byrne with Quotes and Quants. You've been watching our fireside chat with Sumitra Dutta. The new dean, I'm still calling you a new dean, really. I mean, it's a little over a year, year and a half now. 
No, seven months. Okay. Seven months, oh, John. Yes, that's seven right. Months. Oh, of course. Yeah. June of 2022. Yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. Seven months. Job. And I know you were announced in January, so you had a little time off, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is John Brother, Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much.